Okay, so today we're going to be going over some examples using conservation of momentum. Um, in class, we talked about the different types of collisions you have. Um, remember, anytime you have a collision, you have a situation where there's no external forces, and therefore the total momentum of the system is conserved. Um, now, if you look at the different types of collisions, in every type of collision, the total momentum is conserved. Um, the kinetic energy is what is different between the different types of collisions. And so we talked about this in class. Um, an elastic collision is one where the kinetic energy of the system doesn't change before and after the collision. You typically see that with uh, collisions between atoms and an ideal gas. Um, an inelastic collision is a collision where the kinetic energy of the system decreases, typically to heat or deformation or sound or something like that. Most real-world collisions are inelastic collisions, um, at least inelastic to some extent. And then you have perfectly inelastic collisions, which is a type of collision where the kinetic energy of the system decreases, plus the two objects stick together or somehow combine their masses. And I gave lots of examples of that in class. Um, for example, in football, when you tackle somebody and you wrap up, that's an example of a perfectly inelastic collision. Uh, if you have a, a train car hit another train car behind and they, they link together with the connecting system, that's a perfectly inelastic collision. Um, when Tarzan swings down on the vine and catches Jane and whisks her away to safety, that's an example of a perfectly inelastic collision. So that's a very common type of collision, uh, the perfectly inelastic one. And then you have what I call a super uh, elastic collision or an explosion collision, um, where the kinetic energy of the system actually increases, uh, for example, when a bomb explodes, or typically you see this type of collision with a uh, with gun recoil. So what we're, what we're going to do now is just go through some examples um, with different types of collision and conservation of momentum. Okay, so starting with example two. Um, example two and we might have done this one in class, I don't remember. Um, we have two cars. Car one has a mass of 1,000 kilograms and is traveling at a speed of 10 meters per second. When it rear ends car two, which has a mass of 1,200 kilograms and was initially at rest. After the collision, car one remains at rest while car two starts to, to move forward. So here we have a system with two objects. Um, I know it's a conservation of momentum problem because it is a collision problem. And uh, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to recognize that it is a conservation of momentum question. I'm, I'm going to start by identifying my variables. And so I have some masses here. I'm just going to label this, let's say, mass 1 is 1,000 kilograms. Let me just adjust this. OK, and then I have mass 2 which is 1,200 kilograms. Okay, going back to my problem. Um, so car one is initially traveling at a speed of 10 meters per second. Now, momentum is mass times velocity, but we can get around that by just saying whichever way car one is going at the beginning, let's call that the positive direction. Okay, and so I'm going to call V1 initial. Okay, that is the initial velocity of object 1 before the collision, I'm going to call that 10 meters per second. And V2 initial is going to be 0 because car 2 was initially at rest. And then I'm also going to label my other variables, my unknown. It says after the collision, car 1 remains at rest while car 2 starts to move forward. Okay, V2 F is my unknown v1 f is zero because remember car one that is object one after the collision stops moving okay so final velocity of zero meters per second now if we start with our conservation of momentum equation that says the sum of the initial momenta is equal to the sum of the final momenta and we expand that out for a two object problem we get an equation that looks like this, m1v1i plus m2v2i. Okay, this side is the total momentum before the collision, and if momentum is conserved, it should be equal to the total momentum after the collision, so m1v1f plus m2v2f. And now all I have to do is plug in my values. Okay, so I have 1,000 times 10 
plus um, M2 is 1200, but V2I is zero. And so this whole term right here is going to be zero. And so I'm just going to put zero there. On the right side, I have um, M1 times V1F, but V1F is also zero. Okay, and so this term, this first term on the right side is also going to be zero. So I'm just going to write zero plus M2 V2F. So that's 1200 times V2F, which is the unknown. I get 12,000, sorry, 10,000 equals 1200 V2F. And so V2F, I can type that into my calculator pretty easily. That's just 10,000 divided by 1200. And those can be 8.33 meters per second. Now, that part is easy. Okay, so that's the answer to the first question. Now, if you take a look at the second question, what type of collision is this? There is no way to enter this question um, other than based off of the definition of the different types of collision. Now, the exception is obviously that the problem says the objects stick together or combine their masses, then we can infer it's a perfectly inelastic collision. Um, besides that, we have to go based off of the definition um, of the different types of collision. So this is why definitions are important. And so what I'm going to have to do to enter the second question is I'm going to have to evaluate the kinetic energy of the system before and after the collision and compare those two numbers. And if they're equal, it's an elastic collision. Um, if the initial kinetic energy is greater than the final kinetic energy, it's inelastic and so on. Okay, so pause here if you need these values. I'm going to clear the screen. Okay. So let's find the initial kinetic energy that would be the kinetic energy of object one before the collision plus the kinetic energy so this is m1 v1i plus one half m2 v2i squared keep in mind in the kinetic energy equation this v is actually speed and not velocity so the sign makes no difference in kinetic energy equation so actually, I'm going to just erase that. And I can plug my values in 1 half times 1,000 times 10 squared plus 1 half times 1,200 times 0 squared. And if you do that, you actually get, let's see, 500, uh, 500, sorry, 50,000. So 50,000 joules. And then the final kinetic energy, again, this is not the kinetic energy of the individual pieces, but the total kinetic energy available in the system, would be 1 half M1 V1 final squared plus 1 half M2 V2 final squared. Um, this, I can tell you right now, is going to be 0 because V1 F was 0. Um, so just to save on writing, I'm not even going to write that one. And this is 1 half times 1200 times V2F was 8.33, so 8.33 squared. And if we type that into the calculator, we get an answer somewhere around 41,633 joules. Okay, so you would say that the initial kinetic energy is greater than the final kinetic energy. And therefore, this is an inelastic collision. Okay, not a perfectly inelastic collision because it doesn't say the objects stick together, right? But this is definitely an inelastic collision. And that's how you would show your work for that question. Okay, so pause there if you need to. And then we'll move on in just a moment. Okay, so I'm going to clear the screen and we're going to go on to the next question. Now, Pause here and read what it says on the slide. Okay, so just a quick note about perfectly inelastic collisions, and I talked about this in class, but by definition, a perfectly inelastic collision is a collision where the two objects somehow combine their mass after the collision. Now, the trick to that, uh, solving this type of problem, is that if the two masses combine, they have the same final velocity after the collision, right? Because if the masses combine, instead of being two separate masses, they're basically now one big combined mass. Um, and therefore, if they're one big combined mass, they have the same velocity. So, uh, 
that simplification is going to allow us to solve problems with perfectly inelastic collisions. So example three. Okay, example three says solve the following problem and identify the type of collision. A one kilogram dart moving horizontally at 10 meters per second makes impact and sticks to a piece of wood. As soon as you see sticks to a piece of wood, number one, you should be thinking, hey, this is a collision, momentum is conserved. Number two, you should be thinking, hey, it must be a perfectly inelastic collision based off of the fact that the masses are going to combine. So when it says identify what type of collision this is, we don't need to look at the kinetic energy of the system to know that this is a perfectly inelastic collision. By the way, do keep in mind there's no such thing as a perfectly elastic collision. Um, anytime masses combine in a collision, kinetic energy is always lost. Therefore, it's a perfectly inelastic collision. So anyway, uh, so the dart sticks a piece of wood with a mass of 9 kilograms, which then slides across a friction-free surface. What is the speed of the wood and dart after the collision? So take a moment now. Um, hopefully you work through this on your own um, and come up with an answer so that you can compare to the answer that we're going to get in just a moment. Okay, so let's do example three. So first I'm going to label my masses. I have M1, which is... I believe uh, one kilogram, let me check, one kilogram dart, and then the block of wood has a mass of nine kilograms. Give me just a moment. V1I, again, it tells me um, it's moving horizontally at 10 meters per second. Now that by itself is a speed, but I can just say whichever way the dart is moving at the beginning of the problem, let's say that's the positive direction, and so that's also my uh, velocity of the dart. Okay, so V1I is, what is that, 10 meters per second. 10 meters per second. And then V2I, the velocity of the block of wood before the collision, um, it doesn't say it's moving before the collision, and so I think we can infer from context that it is stationary before the collision. So that's zero meters per second. And then, most importantly, it tells us that they stick together. Okay, now, because they stick together, and I said this before, in a perfectly inelastic collision, they have the same final velocity. Now, what that means is that V1 final is equal to V2 final, but if they're equal to each other, then I don't really need the, the different subscripts, right? I can just call them V final, right? Because they're the same value, there's no, no need to separate V1F and V2F. I can just call it VF. So this is a conservation of momentum question. I start with my conservation of momentum equation right here. I recognize this is a two-object collision, so I expand this out so there's two terms on both sides. I have M1 V1I plus m2 v2i equals m1 v1f plus m2 v2f and then I just plug in values okay I have 1 times 10 plus 9 times 0 equals 1 now remember I don't actually need to call this v1f and v2f I can just call it vf so I'm going to say 1 vf plus mass 2 is 9, so that would be 9 VF. And the trick to perfectly inelastic collision is because they have the same final velocity, I can actually combine these because these are now like terms. So 1 plus 9 is 10, so that would be 10 VF. Just like if you think in algebra, 2X plus 3X is 5X. As long as the variables are the same, you can combine like terms. On the left side, I have 1 times 10, which is 10, and then 9 times 0, which is 0. So that is just 10, and then VF would be 10 divided by 10, which is 1 meters per second. Okay, and so at this point I'm done. That is the answer to example 3. And the second question that asked me what type of collision is this, I don't actually have to justify that um, because I know from context clues it's a perfectly inelastic collision because the objects stick together, because after the collision is over, the objects have combined their mass. So that is example three. Example three. There you go. Pause it if you need to look over that. Okay, so moving on. The next one says on your own. Okay, so I do want you to work 
on this on your own first, and then we can compare answers here in just a minute. Okay, so it says a stationary life raft of mass 160 kilograms is carrying two survivors with masses of 55 kilograms and 72 kilograms respectively. They dive off the raft at the same instant, the 55 kilogram person south at 4.4 meters per second, and the 72 kilogram person north at 4.2 meters per second. At what speed and in what direction does the raft start to move and what type of collision is this? Okay, so this is kind of a unique problem because this is actually a three object problem um, and you might not recognize it as a collision right away, but it is uh, a type of collision and we'll see that later um, because it's a situation where there's no external forces, right? There's, there's forces acting uh, on the raft when they jump off, but they're internal to the system, they're inside the system. And so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to identify our variables. I'm going to call the raft mass one. Um, no special reason, that's just the first number that appears in the problem, 160 kilograms, and then we have 55 and 72 kilograms. I'm going to call that mass 2 and mass 3, 72 kilograms. Okay, now, as you're reading the problem, you might look at these values and be like, oh, that's the initial velocity. But remember, any time you have a collision, you have an initial set of values and a final set of values. Okay, and so the, what you need to think about and focus on is what exactly is the quote unquote collision in the situation? Okay, what is the event that is happening in which momentum is conserved? And um, if you think about that for a moment, you should realize the event that is happening in which momentum is conserved is the people jumping off the raft. In other words, the initial values of the velocities are before they jump off the raft and the final values are going to be after they jump off the raft. And so this 4.4 and this 4.2, those are not initial velocities, they're actually final velocities, okay, because they happen after they jump. So what about before they jump, you ask? Well, before the people jump, everything is stationary, it's not moving. Okay, so V1, V2, V3 are all zero. Okay, now um, for the final value, sorry, this is V1I, V2I, V3I. Now for the final values, V1 final, we need to establish a coordinate system. I'm going to say um, north is the positive direction and south is the negative direction. So I don't know um, I don't know the speed or direction of the raft, so V1 final is my unknown. V2 final, okay, that is the 55 kilogram person. Um, it tells me in the problem they travel south at 4.4 meters per second. That means their speed is 4.4 meters per second, and they're traveling in the negative direction based off the coordinate system I chose. Of course, you can choose whatever coordinate system you want. And V3 final is going to be a positive 4.2 meters per second because they're traveling north. Okay. Now this is a conservation of momentum problem. I'm going to start with my conservation of momentum equation, which is this. I'm going to expand this out, but now I've got three objects, which means I should have three terms on each side. So I have M1 V1 I plus M2 V2 I plus M3 V3I, and then the same thing on the other side. Okay, this is M1V1F plus M2V2F plus M3V3F, and it looks way worse than it is um, because I said this a few minutes ago. Remember that the condition that is happening, the situation that is happening in which momentum is conserved, is the people jumping off the raft, and before they jump nobody's moving. The raft is not moving, none of the people are moving, which means each of these three terms on the left side is actually going to be zero. Okay, so on the left side I have zero plus zero plus zero. On the right side I have 160 V1F, which is my unknown, plus 55 times negative 4.4 plus 72 times 4.2 
And now I, all I have to do is clean this up and do a bit of basic algebra. Okay, so this is 0 equals 160 V1 final plus, okay, I use my calculator to do this, a plus, that's a plus, negative 242 plus 72 times 4.2 is positive 302.4. And now I just solve for V1 final, uh, just using some basic math, and I get a value of 0 0.38 meters per second. Now the question asks what speed and in what direction. Well, this is obviously the speed, the 0.38 meters per second. What about the direction? Notice that this value actually, um, oh, sh should be negative. <laughs> almost missed that because when you add these two numbers together you get a positive value and then you have to subtract it to the other side. So this actually comes out to be um, uh, negative uh, 0 0.38 meters per second which means that their direction is the negative direction which we said is south. Okay so that answers the first uh, question. Now what type of collision is this? You probably already begin to suspect but the initial kinetic energy of the system was zero. Okay, be, because, and I said this before, before the people jump off the raft, nobody is moving, therefore there is no kinetic energy in the system. Now, the final kinetic energy, we could find it um, if we wanted to. I'm not going to do that, but we have all of the final velocities, and so we could easily find that. Uh, but this is going to be a super elastic collision because the kinetic energy increases after the system. Now, how do I know uh, it's going to increase if I don't actually calculate this value? Well, kinetic energy cannot be negative, and so if the initial kinetic energy is zero, uh, the final kinetic energy, I don't know what it is, uh, but it's some number bigger than zero. Okay, therefore, this is a super elastic collision. Okay, so this is the on your own problem on your own. Okay, so you can pause that, read over that, and I'm going to clear in just a second. Okay, so I'm going to clear that off. Okay. And then we're just going to do, let's say, one more problem. Um, both of these problems are the same type of problem and so I'm only going to do one more example two ice skaters standing at rest on a frozen lake push away from each other skater one has a mass of 40 kilograms and is pushed away with a velocity of 3 meters per second a skater two has a mass of 120 kilograms um, what concept is this? this is very similar to the problem we saw before this is a conservation of momentum problem um, because it is a type of collision um, even though it doesn't mention two objects colliding it's a situation in which there's no external forces, um, and therefore it's a conservation of momentum problem. Now, one way you can always spot a conservation of momentum problem is they basically always involve more than one object. Okay, so this is definitely a conservation of momentum problem. And I said before, this is very similar to the problem we saw before. So I'm going to label my variables. I have M1 is 40 kilograms, M2 is 120 kilograms. And Go ahead and see if you can figure out the answer um, so you can put it in and you can compare in just a second. Okay, so um, it says skater 1 is pushed away with a velocity of 3 meters per second. You might think that is the initial velocity, but it's actually not. Um, again, it's, it tells you that the two ice skaters are initially standing at rest. The event, or the collision if you will, is what happens when the two ice skaters push apart. And before they push apart, nobody is moving. Therefore, V1i is 0 meters per second. V2i is 0 meters per second. And the values that were given are all final values. Now, it says skater 1 is pushed away with a velocity of 3 meters per second. Now, 
you can choose whatever coordinate system you want. Let's say that is a pause of 3 meters per second, just because it tells us it's a velocity of pause of 3 meters per second. And so that's going to be V1 final is 3 meters per second. We don't know V2 final. We do know, hopefully, that it's a conservation of momentum problem with two objects. So I expand out my equation like so. And just like in the last problem we did, everything on the left side is actually going to be zero. And so this is going to be another example of what type of collision. Exactly, this is going to be another super elastic collision. So I have zero plus zero equals 40 times three. Now notice what's happening here is before and after the total momentum of the system has to be zero, right? If we have zero on the left, we also have to have zero on the right. So if this skater has a momentum of 120, skater two must have a total momentum of negative 120. And we'll see that in just a second. This is uh, 120 times V2 final. And it's very easy to show that V2F should be negative one meters per second. Okay, so even though after they push apart, they're both moving, this is a super elastic collision. Um, the total momentum of the system is still zero. Okay, because it was zero before the collision, before they pushed apart, and it must still be um, afterwards. However, the kinetic energy, the final kinetic energy is going to be greater than zero. Therefore, this is a super elastic collision. Okay, so there are your two answers. Hopefully that's what you got. Oh, kind of messed that up. This is example four. And then example five. Um, example five is very similar to example four. It's the exact same type of collision. Okay, so you're welcome to try example five on your own just for some extra practice. Please pause there um, if you want to check your answers. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. I will be happy to explain in more detail uh, if you don't understand anything. But that's basically it for this unit. Uh, we talked about momentum and impulse theorem, uh, and we talked about conservation of momentum. And we also talked about force time graphs and how force time graphs can be used to solve um, impulse problems. Uh, when the force is not constant, uh, because the area under a force time graph represents the impulse, aka the change in momentum of an object. Okay, so those are basically the only concepts in this unit. Um, as far as the notes go and the examples go, that we are now done with this unit, and so hopefully we should be ready to move on to the next unit, which is thermal physics. Okay, joy.